Dams, massive feats of engineering, provide something modern life can't function without electricity. Hydroelectric power stations harness the energy of flowing water to generate power, lighting up cities, fueling industries, and driving progress. This was just as true in the 20th century as it is today. But while these towering concrete giants symbolize human innovation, they can also become the source of unimaginable tragedy when built without enough caution. When a dam is constructed with the sole aim of generating energy, without paying attention to the land it's built on or the risks it poses, disaster isn't just a possibility, it's inevitable. One of the most chilling examples of this is the Viant Dam in northern Italy, a catastrophic event that remains one of the deadliest industrial disasters in European history. The idea for the Viant Dam began as early as the 1920s, during a time when industrial progress was sweeping through Europe. But like many ambitious projects of that era, global instability, including World War II, put everything on hold. Italy, directly involved in the conflict, was left in ruins after the war. Only by the mid-1950s, as the country emerged from its wartime devastation, did the dream of the Viant Dam come back to life. By the 1950s, Italy was transforming. The agricultural south was emptying as people migrated to the north in search of better jobs in booming industrial cities. Factories required massive amounts of power, and the nearby Alps, rich in water resources, seemed like the perfect solution. The rugged mountains, with their fast-flowing rivers, made an ideal location for hydroelectric projects. But to harness that power, engineers would need to build big, and they did. When completed in 1960, the Viant Dam stood at a staggering 860 feet tall, making it 138 feet taller than the iconic Hoover Dam in the United States. Even today, as of 2024, the Viant Dam remains the 10th tallest dam in the world, a testament to the ambition and technical prowess of Italian engineers. But beneath this impressive achievement lurked an unseen danger, one that would soon claim thousands of lives. To create hydroelectric power, the Viant Dam formed a massive reservoir with a capacity of 35 billion gallons, an artificial lake designed to fuel a complex water management system. Water would be drawn from nearby valleys through a network of concrete pipes and channels, making it one of the most advanced systems of its time. But almost immediately, there were warning signs. Local residents, particularly those from the nearby villages of Aero and Casso, were deeply worried. These communities, located directly below the dam, had an intimate knowledge of the land. They knew something the engineers either didn't or refused to acknowledge. The dam's foundation was dangerously close to Mount Tuck, a mountain with a reputation that should have given everyone pause. In the local dialect, Tuck was short for poach, meaning rotten or soggy. The mountain also had a chilling nickname, the mountain that walks. For generations, people had believed that Mount Tuck was prone to landslides, a belief rooted in real geological activity, and the locals had good reason to be concerned. Just a few years earlier, in March 1959, a massive landslide occurred only seven miles from the Vine construction site. At the Pontoe Dam, a section of mountain collapsed into the reservoir, sending a 66-foot wave crashing through the valley. While only one person died, the incident should have been a wake-up call. But it wasn't. The Saad Company, responsible for building the Viant Dam, ignored these warnings. Their geological studies claimed the mountain was stable. They insisted there was nothing to worry about. But cracks, both literal and metaphorical, were already beginning to show. By 1959, while construction was still underway, disturbing signs emerged. Workers building a road along the slope of Mount Tok reported visible cracks and ground shifts, clear indications that the mountain was unstable. Independent experts warned that filling the reservoir would increase the risk of a catastrophic landslide. Still, the warnings fell on deaf ears. By October 1959, the dam was completed. The following year, Saad received approval to start filling the reservoir, and almost immediately, the land began to move. Landslides became a regular occurrence. Local newspapers sounded the alarm, publishing reports about the growing threat. Instead of investigating, the authorities sued the journalists for spreading fake news. Meanwhile, the water levels in the reservoir continued to rise, and with them, the danger. 
In November 1960, the first major landslide struck. 27 million cubic feet of earth tumbled into the reservoir, creating a six-foot wave. Thankfully, no one was killed, but the message was clear. Mount Tok was unstable. Over the next three years, engineers scrambled to contain the growing crisis. They lowered the reservoir's water levels, installed monitoring equipment, and even built a bypass tunnel to divert water in case of a landslide. But these efforts were like placing a band-aid on a broken dam. By 1963, the situation had become critical. Heavy rains increased the water level to 814 feet, just 49 feet below the crest of the dam. Ground movement accelerated to 8 inches per day, and entire sections of Mount Tok began sliding downhill. The mountain was on the verge of collapse. The mayor of Aero issued an evacuation order, warning residents to leave the slopes. But it was too little, too late. On the night of October 9, 1963, the inevitable happened. At 10.39 p.m., the side of Mount Tok gave way. In just 45 seconds, a staggering 9.4 billion cubic feet of earth and rock crashed into the reservoir. The impact was so powerful that seismic tremors were recorded as far away as Vienna and Brussels, hundreds of miles from the disaster site. The landslide displaced 13 billion gallons of water, creating a massive wave that surged over the dam's edge. One wave surged up the valley, devastating isolated mountain villages. Another swept deeper into the Alps. But the third wave, the largest, was a nightmare beyond imagination. This 230-foot tall wall of water raced toward the town of Longaro, destroying everything in its path. Within minutes, the peaceful town, home to over 1,300 people, was reduced to rubble. Entire families were wiped out while they slept. Out of the 1,328 residents, 1,269 died. When rescuers arrived, they were met with a scene of unimaginable horror. The once vibrant towns had been transformed into a desolate wasteland. Buildings were flattened as if they had never existed. Roads and pathways had vanished beneath an ocean of mud and debris. The air was thick with the stench of wet earth and broken lives. Survivors, caked in mud and dust, wandered aimlessly, some calling out for lost loved ones, others too shocked to speak. In the silence that followed the wave's fury, only the faint sounds of weeping and the distant clatter of rescue crews echoed through the valley. Entire families were wiped out in an instant. In Longaron alone, out of 1,328 residents, only a handful survived. Parents searching for their children found nothing but broken foundations where their homes once stood. The nearby towns of Casso and Arrow fared no better. 158 lives were lost as the wave tore through their communities, leaving behind only fragments of human existence. Bodies were found miles downstream, some trapped beneath collapsed structures, others swept far into the valley by the sheer force of the flood. For days, rescuers worked tirelessly to recover the dead, but many were never found, swallowed by the earth or carried away by the torrent. The official death toll reached 1,917, but locals and historians believe the true number may be closer to 2,500. Some families were so completely erased that no one remained to report them missing. The Viant Dam disaster was more than just a physical catastrophe. It was a profound human tragedy that exposed the devastating consequences of corporate greed and governmental negligence. In the aftermath, the Italian government launched an extensive investigation resulting in the conviction of several sod executives for negligence. Yet, no amount of legal action could undo the damage or heal the emotional wounds left behind. Today, the scar of the Viant Dam disaster remains, a haunting reminder that nature's warnings must never be ignored. As we continue to push the boundaries of engineering, one question still lingers. Are we still making the same mistakes 